Today on Between the Lines, a look at what we can learn from traditional societies with Pulitzer Prize winning author Jared Diamond. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Professor Diamond won the Pulitzer for his best selling book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Now he returns to our past in search of a better future. With his book, The World Until Yesterday, he highlights the many crucial lessons to be learned from our ancestors so that we can live better lives today. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You, e do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involves a lot of corruption. I don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. Oh. And that is the first thing to do. Professor Diamond, it is a true pleasure to have you as a guest on Between the Lines. It's a pleasure to be with you today. You know, I'm so taken by this because what happened was when I first looked even at the subtitle, What We Can Learn from Traditional Societies, I thought I would get a romantic view of going back in time and we need to be more like the tribal people of New Guinea, but you are so careful not to glamorize necessarily the past nor the future, but to really take elements of tribal society, of what we were originally once was ourselves, and show us what we can really learn from them and what we really should avoid from them. That's essential to the approach of this book. I neither romanticize nor do I demonize traditional societies. An occupational hazard of people who talk about or write about tribal societies is to fall into either of these opposite traps. Um, many people regard tribal societies as primitive, to be swept out of the way, there's nothing we can learn from them, they're brutes. The opposite extreme is that particularly liberal ap academics are prone to romanticize traditional societies and to view them as peaceful, noble, endowed with wonderful qualities, taking good care of their environments, um, models f compared to our vile qualities. But this book is a realistic book. I, uh, people are people, including people in tribal societies. They do some bad things, they make mistakes, they're caught in some bad situations, they do some wonderful things from which we can learn. So I regard it as a middle of the road, realistic book. Well, you know, it's funny because you said, in fact, one of the problems sometimes is, and you give the example, by the way, a lot of this is the study of, a majority of it takes place in New Guinea, but there are lots of other tribal areas that you, you've went to. And one of them that uh, I was really taken by when you said just about academics was, I think it was the Kung, is that how you pronounce it, the Kung? And by the way, is there an exclamation point in front of their name in reality like that? Or is that, you're smiling, there is, isn't there? What is that? Kung, Kung the okay. traditional people of Southwest Africa. They are written exclamation mark K-U-N-G. And that does not mean, wow, I'm surprised, the Kung. <laughs> but the Kung have a system of consonants called click consonants. I can't reproduce them, but it's like K. And so the exclamation mark means a click consonant. It does not mean, wow, the Kung. Oh, uh, OK, because what was interesting was, and I think it was them, or maybe it was the Danny tribe, I don't remember. But there was a someone studying them. And because there was only what they found uh, one murder almost every two years, something like that. It was a very small, finite uh, number that the person who was studying them, if he studied them for a year, may never have saw any crime like you said before and over-romanticize how peaceful and loving they are. Yet you let us know that not only percentage-wise do they have a higher crime rate than we, a murder rate than we do in the United States, I know that sounds mind-boggling, but you let us know that more people have been killed by stones, spears, and primitive weapons than atom bombs, napalm, modern weaponry, an amazing concept that most of us would think just the opposite. The real difference there is the difference between 
relative deaths and absolute number of deaths. Yes, the, the two atomic bombs between them killed about 140,000 people. And the entire human population of the world 80,000 years ago was a million people. So nowadays, because we've got huge populations, 7 billion people in the world, with modern warfare we can achieve big body counts, kill lots of people in a short time. But the percentage of the population killed in modern warfare is rather small. So for example, the United States lost 300,000 people killed in World War II, and that was about a little more than one-tenth of one percent of our population. Low relative death toll, horrible high absolute death toll. In tribal societies, the case of the Kung that you mentioned, yes, it's true that it turns out that the Kung traditionally would have about one murder every two years. And you might say, that's absolutely nothing. An anthropologist going out there and for a one-year project, the chances are against his, his seeing or even hearing of any murder. But then consider that a Kung band consists of 40 people, and of the 40 people, 20 are men and 20 women, and of the 20 men, 10 are adults and 10 women, and, and, and 10 children. And so if one person gets killed every two years, and that person, as usual, is an adult man, then that means that one out of 10 of the adult men has gotten killed every two years. That's a very high relative death rate. And one could sum it up by saying that the absolute death rates in tribal societies are low because there are just few people there to kill. But the risk of a person meeting a violent death is much higher than even in the most dangerous parts of the United States. This is fascinating because you said earlier, and in the book I was going to use it later, about all of us are people are, quote, people. We're all people. Not all the same necessarily, but we are all people. And the one reason that you really wanted to bring the world until yesterday to us was you felt that in, I guess the term is weird, is that correct? The weird society, I, I'll read it, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies, the weirds as we're known, we needed to broaden the sample of humanity in order to get a truer picture of what humanity is like. We were getting only a small slice of humanity and not the broadest possible. Another reason why you, you seem to have had this passion to explore these societies so that you can give us a broader sense of what is, in a, in a sense, our essence. Most generalizations about human societies are based on a really narrow slice of humanity. So for example, you read a psychology journal that is carrying out a cross-cultural study, say cross cultural supposed cross-cultural study of bringing up children. And then you look at what the database actually is. They may have looked at five societies, United States, Germany, Japan, Argentina, Israel, Every one of those societies has state government, writing, schools, and there may be interviews with people. The interviews are typically with college undergraduates in each country. Usually they're psychology majors. So what we have learned from so-called cross-cultural studies of humanity is really studies of Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic societies and their college undergraduates studying psychology who are about 18 years old. But and not as broad as you'd think, am <laughs> I right? That's not very broad. The, most of the world is not Western educated, industrial rich, democratic. And so if you really want to generalize about human nature, you've got to go out there and study New Guineans, Africans, native South Americans, hunter-gatherers, small-scale farmers. Now the big leap that we see here is when we go from the sort of tribal state that we were in for most of our lives as, as human beings to what we call the state. And there were some st stages in between. Obviously, there were, as you said, there were tr bands, tribes, chieftains, things like that. But the big leap was when we go into what we call a state society because there are so many people due to the, uh, the conceived invention of agriculture is what I'm guessing, right? Food production was it enabled us to finally settle. We now are looking at the state in versus the tribal experience and what can 
we who live in a state with our bureaucracies and the things that we cannot escape according to you because as a large population like this, we cannot have the same face-to-face -face communication as the Kung do or uh, any of the New Guinea Highlanders do. So that, that's the big leap, isn't it? It is a big leap, and here's a, here's a personal example of that, that big leap. In the few minutes, Barry, that you and I have been together, I have not made any move to kill you, and I have not detected on your part any move to kill me, and yet we were strangers yeah. until recently. In traditional societies, one knows everybody. You don't encounter strangers. You're living in a village or a band with 40 people, maybe a couple of hundred people, and you know their names, you know their relationships, you've known them for their lives, you do not encounter strangers. If you do encounter a stranger, it's a frightening, dangerous experience. In our popular societies, though with 300 million Americans, we encounter strangers every day. Every time I walk across the UCLA campus, I encounter hundreds of strangers, and it's not terrifying. So that's perhaps the most fundamental difference between tribal, small-scale societies where you know everybody and our big modern societies where we have to deal with strangers and we have governments and laws and police to make sure that we don't make trouble when we encounter strangers. There's a number of key things that you want us to grab information and literally make comparisons to. One of them is that justice and how justice is admitted in the state society and how it's meted out in the tribal society. Because there is, as you said, if everyone knows each other in the tribal society and strangers are either killed or made sure they, they split, even the way they do justice, they are more concerned with repairing the relationship than we are in our society where there may not have been any relationship between the two parties. That's one of the key differences in even the justice systems and how they work in a tribal society versus that of a state. The, you're right. The justice system of a small society has fundamentally different aims from the justice system of our modern state level society. Our justice system, we are accustomed to it. There are lawyers and there are courts. And if you commit a crime and you're guilty of the crime, yes, you're sent to jail. You're sent to jail for several reasons. Um, one is to maybe to give you a chance to rehabilitate yourself. Another is to punish you. And a third, which is what the government particularly cares about, is to set an example, to show people that if they commit a crime, they too will, will go to jail, and to show that the government has the ultimate responsibility. If somebody steals from me, I am not permitted to take matters into my own hands and go steal it back or go kill that person. Instead, it's the government in our society that carries out justice. But in a state society where there's no government, Justice is a personal matter. You have to work it out with the other person, but that other person in a small society, you've known him or her for your whole life, and so the main point of the justice system is to ensure that you can talk to that person whom you'll be dealing with for the rest of your life. Or, as you said, and, and one of the things that I almost, uh, when you wrote it, I almost had a smile and I almost envisioned you having a smile on it as well, and that is vengeance. Mm -hmm. Vengeance, you talk about, is one of the most primal, human, you, I think you associate it like with love, with, with uh, fear. It's one of those primal things that come out with us, and we are, of course, so dissuaded from it in our modern society, which I think we're all thankful for, but there was almost a, a wistfulness of it that, you know, we no longer get a chance to have revenge. I know that sounds funny, but even when you were writing, and you're smiling now too, so I see that you, there was something about that, isn't there? It's a, it's a shift that we must make as social beings. Think of the emotions that we encourage our children to express. We want our children to love. Um, we want our children to express anger. We want our children to feel sad and not deny their sadness. Um, we want our children to acknowledge that they hate. We don't want them to act on their hate, but we recognize that hatred is a normal human emotion and envy is a normal human emotion. But what we do not want 
teach our children to do is to have vengeful feelings. That's considered not nice. And yet the reality is that if somebody does bad, something bad to you and gets away with it, um, we feel vengeful about it. It's a normal human response, but it's a human response that, you were taught, that we are taught isn't nice. So there are two things about it. One is we should not act on our vengeful feelings, fair enough. We should not act on our hatreds. But in addition, we, in addition, we are programmed to think that vengeful feelings are bad and we should be ashamed of them. But they're normal, just like love and hatred and anger. You know, you talked about uh, teaching children. That is one of the key things that we really can learn from the tribal societies, and that is in child rearing. So many examples uh, are given in how they are literally in tune with their children in a lot different way than we are. And that was one of the points where and again, not every, like you say, there's no way that everything you take from that society would work here and vice versa. But I think in child rearing, there was a lot of lessons that we could learn from some of the, the tribal or our, but you know, it's even funny. I don't even want to say tribal, from our past, because it is our past. That's what you really want us to know. It is our past. That's what we were. We are the same, the same genes, the same everything passes on to us. Tribal societies have to bring up their children just like we have to bring up their children. And the fact that we, we societies with governments have ended up conquering the tribal societies, yes, it means that we have stronger weapons and more soldiers and generals, but it doesn't mean that we found better ways of bringing up children. I'm impressed in my work in New Guinea and, and people who've been in rural areas of Africa and South America, routinely they end up impressed that the children in these small tribal societies are more self-confident, they're more capable of making decisions, they're more socially skilled, they're more precociously mature, they don't go through adolescent crises. In short, all these things that we would love for our children, but then consider how we treat our children and how they in tribal societies treat their children. Our children, we micromanage, so the child comes, we send the child to school, and at 3 o'clock, the child has, to, has soccer lesson, and 4 o'clock do the homework, and 5 o'clock take out the trash. So we give orders to our children, and of course our children don't learn to be independent because they're not exercising their own judgment. But in traditional societies, from babies onwards, they're making their own decisions. And that was one of the things that my wife and I adopted in bringing up our own children. It's not that we let our children at the age of two play with sharp knives or roll into the fire. But we did like, let our children, insofar as possible, make their own decisions with some surprising results. At the age of three, one of our children decided he loved snakes and he wanted to have pet snakes. All right, this is a three-year-old boy who can make his own decisions and we let him have pet snakes. <laughs> Good decision? Good decision. So <laughs> he went through years of accumulating in our house. Eventually he had 147 <laughs> pet frogs, snakes, lizards, salamanders. And after about a dozen years, he went through a snake phase, thought of going into snakes as a career, but decided against it. And eventually he decided he wants to be a restaurant chef. And so uh -huh. one day he told us, tomorrow I want to enter culinary school. Will you pay my tuition? all right, this is a boy that we had raised to make his own decisions. Now let's go to the other spectrum, which is where I also found so much to be learned and to be avoided as well. And that's how we treat old people. And, and I think the, the title was The Treatment of Old People, Cherish, Abandon, or Kill. And that's kind of funny because in some of the societies you study, the, the older generation is truly revered and, and worshipped, and in some of them, because they have to move to place to place, and if an old person can't move, they'll kill them, or they'll let them rot, or they'll let them be. So there's obviously that lesson we don't want to learn, but there is a sort of what you described, the more useful we can find ways to keep our older generation useful then the greater chance our society has to be really blossom. We are talking here about what most people will admit is one of the disaster areas of American society, our treatment of old people. 
paradoxically, although now we have better medical care and retirement and pensions, and one might naively think that the situation of old people would be better than any time in human history, the reality is that for many or most older Americans, old age is a time of loneliness, of social isolation, compared to traditional societies where it can be either much worse or much better. As you mentioned, in some traditional societies, nomadic ones would have to move every day or every week. It's just impossible to carry the old people with you once they get infirm when you got to carry your children in pots and pans. And so old people in nomadic societies will often get abandoned or actively killed. Thank God it's not like that in the U.S. But in sedentary traditional societies, old people live out their lives next to their children and their lifelong friends. And so the problem of loneliness that we have, not only in the United States, but in most first world societies, the problem of loneliness doesn't rise because you live out your life surrounded by your relatives and friends. There was one more term that I, I couldn't leave without getting to, even though I know our time is almost up, and that was constructive mm -hmm. paranoia. And uh, you mentioned it even as something that you felt uh, akin to. You, you felt a relationship with it. Let's go into constructive paranoia because I'm a New York City boy. I sleep with the baseball bat <laughs> near my bed. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> look at that. I mean, but you know, so it's, it's, I know what that constructive paranoia is and I was able to relate to it very well. That was something that you really thought was important for us to be aware of. That's something that I learned in New Guinea. New Guineans, because they don't have police and doctors to bail them out if they make a mistake, New Guineans have learned to be ultra careful. And in particular, they're sensitive to the risks of things that they do every day. Each time you do it, you're not likely to get in trouble, but you do a thousand times and it'll catch up with you. For me, the most dangerous thing that I did today and the most dangerous thing that I'll do for the rest of the week is I took a shower. Okay, now, and we know that in a shower you risk slipping in the shower and breaking your leg, but really, Jared, what's your chance of slipping in the shower? One in a thousand? Yes, one in a thousand, but now do the numbers. I'm 75 years old. Statistically, my chance is good of living till age 90. I got 15 years ahead of me. Shower every day, that means I have 5,475 showers ahead of me. And if my chances of slipping in the shower are one in 1,000, I'm going to kill myself five times before I reach my life expectancy of 90 years. In other words, I've got to be much more careful in the shower than reducing my risk of slipping to one in 1,000. That's an example of constructive paranoia. I'm, pa the word paranoid is a nasty word. It means exaggerated fears. In the shower, I'm constructively paranoid. I'm ultra careful, and some people might say I'm exaggerating, but the numbers show you that I'm right to be really careful in the shower. Now, I don't even know if we'll have time for this, but I can't stop without asking about the role of religion because it plays a major role throughout all of human history from its prior tribal aspects all the way to our modern times. And what's interesting is when you brought out how we know that religion originally was the way the states, in a certain sense, could have moral codes as well because they, they supplied some of the moral codes the religions did. But it is amazing how in our most modern society, the United States of America, the highest technological society, it's also still the highest religious society. And I found that dichotomy such an interesting thing, even as you're taking us back six million years, so to speak, in, in tribal understandings. I find it puzzling too, and many th people find it puzzling that in the United States, the most technologically advanced of first world societies, the most scientific society, nevertheless the United States is the most strongly religious first world society. And one can debate about why that's the case. But clear is that religion is something that has changed its meaning throughout human history 10,000 years ago. And one can still read this in the, in the Iliad and Odyssey of the stories of the ancient Greeks. Religion had a big function of explanation, accounting for the sun moving across the sky and the tides and the winds. Today, with modern science, religion has much less function of explanation. 
religion has changed its functions. Formerly religion with the first states, religion taught us to obey the king because the king was considered divine. Now religion does not tell us to obey President Obama. Instead there are laws that tell us to obey President Obama. That just illustrates that religion is something that has changed its meaning throughout human history over the last 11,000 years. Professor, our time is up. I just want to thank you for sharing all those changes of human history with us today. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure, and thank you for joining us. Now, before Professor Diamond leaves, I'd like to leave you with these words from the world until yesterday. We should not naively idolize small-scale societies and castigate state government as, at best, a necessary evil. On the other hand, many small-scale societies do possess some features that we could profitably incorporate into our own state societies. I'm Barry Kibrick. Look closely between our tribal roots and life in our modern world, and we might just find a better way. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl.